Welcome to episode 7 of our series on surnames of Southern Appalachia. It's been great to receive requests from about 800 viewers. Please know that I appreciate the opportunity to talk about them, so it's not a problem. But it's hard to appreciate the fact that there are hundreds, indeed thousands of surnames just in Southern Appalachia. To make our task more manageable, I'm focusing on early Southern Appalachian surnames. Each of the names we'll examine today was requested by folks in our YouTube community. In case you missed the previous videos on surnames, I'll post a link to them in the comments section. So today on the Vantage Point, we're going to jump right in and look at the origins and meanings of 11 family names found in Southern Appalachia. I hope you'll join me. Let's get started. Number one, Meeks. Psalm 3711 lets us know that Meek is a biblical description of a humble, mild person. According to Harrison, the surname Meek was adopted as a surname in England before 1100 AD. As the Meek will inherit the earth suggests, the English surname was given to a humble or mild person. When an S is added to Meek, it means that the person who carries the name descends from the son of Meek. The surname is found in the Scottish records and Cooper, and in which I'm probably mispronouncing, in the 15th century. Cooper is a small city in County Fife, the home of the Royal and Ancient St. Andrew's Golf Club. Members of the early Meek family were tenants of land owned by nobles. The surname is found in Ireland, but according to McGlysick, it's an established English name. It's been there since the 1600s. Number two, Harvey or Hervey. The surname Harvey is an old English name introduced into Great Britain by the Normans. But the name was from Brittany, France, not Normandy. You might recall that in episode 6 I described how William the Conqueror brought allies from Flanders and Brittany. They brought their cultural baggage with them, including surnames. Among his allies were Brittany, from Brittany were soldiers who spoke Britain. The Celtic tongue is close to the Welsh language. Harvey is borrowed from a Breton saint named Hervé. Looking across the Irish Sea, Harvey is not well represented in the Republic of Ireland. It's rather common in Ulster, though, where it can be English or of Scottish origin. A paper trail is needed to track down the origin of your family line. Number three, Prater. In England, the name is commonly spelled with an E. Most of the Praters of Southern Appalachia that I've known spell their name without the E. Like many of our ancestors, phonics worked for the earliest Praters. There seems to be only one point of origin for Prater. In Norman French, it was derived from the French words for priest or presbyter. It's not well represented in Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. That doesn't mean that there aren't Praters living in those regions. They're just not common. It looks to me like we can call Prater an Americanized form of an English name introduced into Great Britain by Normans. How about that? Number four, white. Of course, white is a color. The surname white has shared origins between England and Scandinavia. It was given to a person with a fair complexion, kind of like mine. Since there are many fair-haired people in those regions, the surname most likely sprung up in diverse places. Harrison claims that the surname first appears in England in the 8th century. That's pretty far back in time. The Bishop of Litchfield was so named. The classic acknowledges that White is an English name among the Irish, but it's quite common and has been so since the 14th century. According to Wales Online, it's the 38th, mo 38th most popular surname in Wales. White is also found in Scotland, especially in and around Edinburgh and East Lothian. In Southern Appalachia, the surname could have originated in Ireland or Great Britain. You'll probably need a paper trail to determine the origin of your specific line. Number five, Copeland. In England, the name is often spelled without the E. It comes from Old English and it can mean a dweller at a peak or high ground. It can also refer to a dweller at a piece of land that terminates in an acute angle. Harrison suggests that Copeland originated in Cumberland where peaks can reach between 2,000 and 3,200 feet in elevation. Cumberland lies in northeastern England on the Scottish border. Copeland has a small presence in Ireland, but it's not particularly common in Wales. Black tells us that Copeland first appears in the Scottish records in 1249. By 1455, the surname was found in the Orkney Isles. If I were a betting person, I would think that the surname in America was introduced by immigrants from England or Scotland. Number six, Keen. Being a fan of the TV show Blacklist, I was delighted to receive a request for Keen. One of the main characters in the first seven seasons was named Elizabeth Keen. 
Keen seems to have one country of origin. It comes from Middle English and even appears in some of Chaucer's writings. Keen means bold or sharp, as in, she has a sharp mind. Number seven, Patterson. I've known quite a few people in East Tennessee with the Patterson surname. The name Patterson had a long journey in spellings to reach its present form in southern Appalachia. First, it's derived from Latin. You might note that St. Patrick's real name was Patricius, so the root of Patterson is Patricius. Patrick is an anglicized version of that name. When Patrick had a son, Patrickson was coined, but it seems that in Scotland the surname was sometimes changed to Patterson. In Ireland, the name is common only in Ulster. Given the long-standing prevalence of the name Patterson in southern Appalachia, I would describe this surname as Scots-Irish or Ulster Scots. Number eight, Hawkins. Hawkins is an English surname that Harrison claims is a double diminutive of the personal name Harry. My dad and grandfather would be happy about that. The classic acknowledges that in Ireland, Hawkins has English roots. It doesn't seem to be very common in Scotland, and it's not among the more common surnames in Wales. I think I would slightly disagree with Harrison and McLeish that can call Hawkins not an English surname, but an Anglo-Irish surname. Number nine, Fugit. I must admit that I had a challenge to find the origin of Fugit. The surname is common in eastern Kentucky and East Tennessee. None of my library sources at first glance mentioned the name, so I had to believe that Fugit originated on the continent. More than one online source claimed an English origin, but I doubt the veracity of those sources. Another online source pointed to central France where the name referred to someone who bundled items. If the name originated with the Normans, it would have been a, a well-established name in at least England, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It looks like it is a French Huguenot surname. The French Huguenots were Protestants who suffered greatly after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Many of them first went to Ulster before coming on to the American backcountry. Number 10, Kilby. The B-Y in Kilby is a clue to the origin of Kilby. It means farm or estate. The surname was introduced into Great Britain and the English-speaking world by Vikings. Kilby's not common in Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. That pretty much leaves Yorkshire, England for the origin of Appalachia's Kilby surname. Number 11, Gordon. Harrison and Black agree that this Scottish name has roots among the Norman nobles, who were given lands and titles in Berwickshire in the 12th century. Berwickshire is in the southeastern corner of Scotland and borders Northumberland in England. The surname is territorial in origin. One of the earliest records of the surname mentions Adam de Gordon, who accompanied Louis VI of France on a crusade to the Holy Land in 1270. Gordon has a presence in Ireland, but it's most common in Northern Ireland's County Antrim. It doesn't appear as one of the more common surnames in Wales. It looks like the Gordon surname in America and the Commonwealth is either Scottish or Ulster Scots. In Appalachia, that would be about as Scots-Irish as they come. Well, friends, that's all I have for you today. I hope you got something meaningful out of the discussion. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And please note that the Vantage Point has 73 videos posted on YouTube. They feature a variety of topics that involve history and geography, while sometimes touching on a current event that should be seen through a historical lens. I invite you to check them out. And that's it. I look forward to seeing you here again on The Vantage Point. God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.